to some of the simple functional aspects of functions. No pun intended. So, how could you describe what a function is within JavaScript? I, I think the I like the first line there. It's a callable behavior. It, that's one way to look at it. It's something that you're going to execute. Uh, but it is implemented as an object, and which means it has other uh, features, like being able to uh, play around, uh, pass them around, uh, take them in as arguments to other functions, so they can get really uh, interesting there. Uh, and then there's this concept of even hoisting. Now, what do you think that means, Jeremy? Hoisting. Hoisting is um, uh, something that in other languages you may kind of take for granted, but um, if you ho when a function is hoisted automatically, that just means that if the function is defined below the code where it's actually called, that's completely acceptable. The uh, compiler has looked ahead and seen that there are functions defined later in the code, and, um, and, and those are acceptable, but when you define your, and when you define your uh, code in that way, it's okay. So let's go ahead and look at my screen here real quick. I'm going to end here. I'm going to declare a function like this. Function, I don't need to receive anything. Actually, I'm going to give it a name, my function. And here's the body of my function. So that's a perfectly valid uh, operation there. But there's another way to define a function, and that would be like this. We'll call this first one, actually, let's call it f1. And we'll call our second one f2, and we're going to show it like this. Okay, so those are both valid functions. That this one is called f2, and its value is a function, and this one is called f1, and it is a function. But because this one is using the, the the classic syntax for defining a function, first of all, it doesn't need a semicolon at the end. But this one technically does. It'll work without it, but technically that one needs a semicolon. Now let me go ahead and above both of these functions, I'm going to try to call log, and I'm going to log the results of f1. So I'm going to call f1. And then I'm going to say log, and I'm going to call f2. So before these have been defined, I'm going to try to call them. And we'll see if that's successful. Go. Bam. I dropped right out because I used control F5. Now if I hit F5, I'll actually go into debug mode in Visual Studio. And now it'll stop at that breakpoint and let me know what's going wrong. And it's saying, hey, I expected an object right here. You told me F2 was a function, and I haven't seen that as a function before. So let's go look at this. Ah, in fact, f2 has not been declared as a function yet. But it had no problem at all with f1 because it was defined in classic function syntax, and so it's been hoisted. Now, one more thing I want to show you about the behavior of functions is the behavior of arguments in them. So first of all, let me go ahead and modify this a little bit. I'll get rid of f2 altogether, and for f1, you can see that I'm calling f1, and I'm not defining any arguments in here. This would be a, an argument definition, a, b, and c. But I'm not going to define any arguments there. But when I call it, I'm actually going to send some arguments. So we'll call this 1, and we'll call this 2, and we'll do 0 0.78, and we'll do a dynamic object, and we'll do a dynamic array. We're passing all kinds of stuff oh into this goodness. function. So, let me get this straight. You've defined this function to take no arguments. And you're breaking the rules, so to speak, and you're saying, I don't care. I'm going to pass these in anyway. Absolutely. Interesting. Absolutely. So now let's go drop down here into our function. And I'm going to use a magic keyword here that some people haven't seen before. Hmm. Debugger. If you just put the word debugger there, it's, it's like making a breakpoint without having to type a statement and put a breakpoint on that statement. Hmm. So if you just type debugger and hit F5, bam, you land at the debugger because we called this function here. Mm -hmm. And so here we are. And here, we can open the JavaScript console, and we can look at what's been given to us. It looks like nothing's been given to us. At least, we haven't called them by name. But we can, we can look at this arguments variable and see that it actually is an object, and it has five things in it. So look at that, five that, things that you, were passed You got in. me confused here. You, you went into this Java console. You typed the word arguments. Where was that declared? Arguments was never declared. It's an inherent part of every function. And I'm in the context of this function right now. Oh. And so right here, arguments is perfectly valid syntax. Wow. Yeah. And so I could, for instance, I could refer to the fourth thing that was passed in. That should be this dynamic object. And I could refer to that fourth thing with a three. And that would be an object. I could refer to the first thing that was passed in. That would be argument zero. And that would be the, number, the word one. 
Wow. Yeah. So those are just a couple of characteristics of functions that make it interesting developing in this world. <laughs> That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, so I appreciate the, the thought there on the hoisting and the arguments. I want to go back and talk about something that was actually done in Jeremy's code sample, but we didn't really formally talk about it yet. So uh, I'm going to just talk about some of the basics. In fact, there's different kinds of functions. There's functions that just do something. So think of that as I execute, I do, I don't return anything, I don't take anything, I just do, right? And then there's I get something types of functions. So in the second example, it's just saying, hey, you know, you got something to return, then you're probably going to use the return keyword and you're going to return something out of there. That seems uh, reasonable. You already talked about arguments, whether there's one, two, or I guess in your case, none. <laughs> if you're using the arguments keyword, that would work as well. Uh, but now I want to show a different side of this by uh, talking about this term method. And so what we're doing here is we're declaring a variable, as we learned when you chatted about variables, it, it's called ops. And ops is equal to, it has that open curly brace, and then uh, you'll notice down below it has that uh, uh, closing curly brace. In fact, uh, if I just zoom in right into that, you'll see this is basically where ops ends, right there. And what we've defined in between this curly brace and, and the other one is the ability to have a function named add, and it's a member of ops. Once that function becomes a member of this curly brace thingy, uh, which we'll just call an object for now, we'll say that object happens to have an add method in it, and that add method is a function that takes two numbers in and returns uh, the result of that. So down below, if I say var x equals ops dot add three comma five, well, three and five get passed into here, and then they're added together. That's, that's why we get that x equals eight. But I can't call ops dot add numbers, even though that's the name of the function, which is kind of interesting. But before I explain why it's not valid, I do want to say that the, the magic here is just kind of saying, if you're going to hear the terms methods or functions, the primary difference between the two, well, look at it this way. A method is a function. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're not trying to say that there's some kind, something different other than the fact that it's the context of where the function is being called. If it's, if it's a named property, like in the example of ops, where it has an add function off of the object itself, we can say it's a method which is really a function. So just getting a little nomenclature out of the way. But uh, going back over into our example, it, it, you know, why is it not valid to say add numbers? Uh, so you have any guesses on it? It looks like it's hidden to me. You are correct. And in fact, that is what I'd like to get into right now. And that is scoping, which is a, it's a pretty big deal, especially when we're dealing with uh, our Windows 8 applications, and we're trying to figure out how we're going to do uh, uh, proper structuring of our code, uh, a lot of it has to deal with this topic, and that is function scope. So everything we've talked about so far kind of leads to some functionality, and now we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of the advanced features of uh, functions with regard to scope. So. When we say function scope, and when Jeremy said, uh, looks like it's hidden, that's because it was. Now, if we intentionally know that, that may be exactly what we're intending to do. And, and the reason, why would you ever want to reduce anything explicitly in code? I mean, or, or minimize it or hide it. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah. Why, why would you want to hide anything? Yeah, I, I think that I don't want to have access to things that I shouldn't have access to. So I want to hide them. Sure. Uh, and the other thing, too, is if you have a whole bunch of functions, let's say you have hundreds of functions, but in reality, at the application level, you really only need to call a few of them in order to do what you need to do, and a lot of them are just helper functions. Well, you could reduce the complexity of your own little APIs, if you will, by not revealing all the unnecessary helper functions that might be doing the, you know, it's kind of like literally a car. You look under the hood, you're glad it has an engine, but the behavior that you care about is turning the key, uh, and which makes the car start, right? That, that's the most important function of all to you. You don't care what's happening under the hood. Uh, what if you had to do all the stuff under the hood? You had to manually tweak the spark plugs in order to, I mean, or it's getting complicated now to start to drive. So well, it's kind of the same thing with your code. 
if you could just make available what you need to do in your code, you can hide certain functionality, mask certain things, and it makes it a lot easier for you to uh, call. So whether it's you shouldn't have access to it or uh, you don't want to have all sorts of unnecessary uh, choices to make, then you should consider doing data hiding, which can be done with uh, our discussion here on function scope. And that's really what encapsulation is. It's a, encapsulation is an object-oriented terminology. It's one of the facets of an object-oriented language. That's the ability to do some data hiding or encapsulating behaviors and, and uh, having indirect means by which you can call them or retrieve data. So let's look at this example of scope. We have a variable called x that's equal to 2,000. Then we have a function called some func, and we have a variable inside of that function that's equal to 12. And then we also re immediately return that variable value from the function. So down below, if I try to say variable z equals x plus y, it's an invalid use of y. And so what would be the reason for that? It's hidden. It's hidden. <laughs> we declared the variable in a function. That means it's not accessible outside of the function in terms of accessing that actual variable directly. However, because we returned y in the function, that's why the next line of code is valid. x plus some func executing it, which returns the value of y. That's the example there of retrieving that um, hidden value without actually getting to the specific variable name. So very simple discussion there on one level of scope. Now, this is the thing that was being done. Uh, if, you, if you didn't notice it, we've been declaring functions in, in some of our samples. But if you were looking at the outer context, we were declaring functions inside of functions. So this is just another example of what that would mean. And we're especially going to look at the scoping aspect of it. The first function there is called outer function. Notice it takes in an argument of n. Now, once we have that value of n, notice that the inner function, which takes no arguments, can return n times n. And that would seem to make sense, because n is being passed into the outer function. That means it's, it's scoped everything within that function, even functions defined within that function. Sounds complicated, but it will actually work. It'll return the time, you know, the value of itself uh, times. So, we return the inner function as the return value of that outer function. So if you say variable x equals outer function 4, then ultimately the return value is going to be 16 because you know 4 times 4 will equal that. But I can't access that inner function directly. So again, think of that inner function going back to the analogy with the car. That's your engine. That's an engine component inside of this other object, you know, this other function. They're saying, well, you don't need to tweak the certain things directly. You could just call this bigger outer function. And if it happens to have healthier or supporting functions inside that are doing some specific uh, algorithms or specific uh, work processes, you don't even need to be aware of that. You just care about, hey, I'm calling you. I want to get a result back. And as long as it's doing its job, regardless of the complexity inside, it's OK. So, but that's important to understand because if you're declaring inner functions and outer functions, at this point, they, they are completely hidden. So you've also eliminated the possibility for yourself to call it if you wanted to call it independently. So let's go ahead and return back now and talk about immediate functions. And, and there's a. Uh, a couple ways that these been referred to. Sometimes you'll hear them called self-executing functions. And I'm giving you two flavors on the screen right now of how they can be declared. And, and uh, this is what I'm, I mean. These red uh, braces over here are, are indicating the outer braces of the first one. Whereas over on this side, you'll notice that these uh, square or these uh, braces are, or parentheses are on the outside. Uh, both styles work. The main reason why you would do this is because you want to have the code, which is really represented by the ellipsis in both of these examples, to execute as this is being processed. 
That's a, that's a very interesting thought, because when we typically think of functions, if I go 